la Universidad de Amberes, miembro desde el 2023. Miembro internacional del Club de Exploradores, capítulo continental y capítulo noruega. Desde el 2022, miembro del Club Rotario. Desde el 2019, miembro de la Asociación Nacional Belga de Fotógrafos Profesionales Más Uniso. Ha investigado la relación y conflicto entre el ser humano y la naturaleza, enfocándose en la ciencia. Ha utilizado la imagen para conectar la brecha entre la ciencia, la política y la industria. Se ha especializado en océanos, islas remotas, regiones polares y sus comunidades. Ha visitado 114 países navegando todos los océanos de norte a sur. Delegado de Bélgica en la Conferencia de las Naciones Unidas sobre el Cambio Climático, COP25 Madrid, COP26 Glasgow y COP28 Dubái. Jefe de Delegación de la Red Mundial de Océanos de la Conferencia de las Naciones Unidas sobre el Cambio Climático, COP27 en Egipto. Ha colaborado con múltiples gobiernos, instituciones, científicas y empresas. Ha sido asignado por el Departamento de Política Científica Federal de Bélgica para la difusión del buque de investigación Bélgica. Embajador del Pacto Climático de la Unión Europea desde el 2023. Exposiciones en el edificio Bellarman de la Unión Europea. Exposición en el Parlamento Federal de Bélgica y conferencias en el Senado belga. Exposiciones en cuatro embajadas belgas. Conferencias en los siete continentes, incluyendo la Antártida. Presentados en la conferencia magistral de este foro ambientalista a Christian Clowers. Presidente Magistrato, Ricardo Sodi, Sophie Sodi, and team. Wonderful, thank you so much for the great invitation, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to speak for you today. Thank you for being here. So, I would like to start with the image. <laughs> with this image. We all know 70% of our globe is covered by ocean. Now this specific photo, I took it at the equator, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the expedition of five weeks on a ship, and I took it at noon, because that's the moment where you have the brightest light. The sun is the closest to the Earth at the equator at noon. So I wanted to, to document and show you and the world how blue and wonderful this, this water really is. This is the ocean. The bluest color the ocean can show itself. Now I spent the last three years, uh, I dedicate my life to really document the purity, the lost pure places, including our ocean and polar regions. And those corners on our planet that are really vulnerable, that are still untouched, Pero siguen sin ser I'm a man with a mission. As a photographer, con una misión, como I... <laughs> okay, doesn't work. Creo que no funciona el clicker. No, it doesn't. I don't know. Uh, so that doesn't work. Okay. It's stuck. Um, Se atoró, okay. por favor, alguien me puede ayudar. So let me reconnect. I'm sorry for that. So as a photographer, Como I use image as a tool to bridge, to make, para unir, para to make connections. Para hacer conexiones. Still doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry, we did the test, but... Uh... So, you have policy makers, Entonces, governments, embassies and so on. You have the scientific world, people investigating, trying to understand in numbers and data. You have the industry, they need a legal framework, they provide a lot of the innovation and so on. But all of these three realities,
all of these three realities, they speak a different language. Policy reports, data sheets, strategy reports, and so on. So image is a universal language. Image, for image, you don't need to speak a language. Every one of you, I don't really speak Spanish, I'm sorry, I understand a little bit, and it's a great language, I would love to learn it. But language can be a barrier. Image is not a barrier, it doesn't lie, and it evokes emotion. So for this sort of wonderful conference, I will focus on climate change, that is my focus in my photography, the conflict between man and nature, between humans and nature, which is strange because we are also nature, we are a part of nature, we are one of these 8 million species. But yet, one of the 8 million caused a lot of damage to 1 million out of these 8 million species. So biodiversity is another big topic of what I do. I think it's a clicker now that doesn't work. Okay. So using image to build bridges, very important. I will also focus a little bit on the importance of scientific research. This is the Belgica. This is the research vessel of our country, Belgium. It's a state-of-the-art research vessel. Research in polar regions. Polar regions are melting. Polar regions are warming up in the Arctic at least four to six times faster than anywhere in the world. So it is really imperative, almost. It's very important that we understand how this change looks like. That is where I come in. I go to the front line and I go to take photos and show it to the world. All of the photos you see, none of them are manipulated. This is what my camera was catching, the light that my camera, camera caught, but it was also what I saw. Although for me it was a bit darker. This is the Arctic in the winter. It was very dark actually. It's like late winter. The camera can register a little bit more than our human eyes, so it's a long shutter. It was snowing, you don't see the snow anymore. But look at this beauty, there's no color, but believe me, it's beautiful. A lot of my work has to do also with indigenous people. And it is in the Arctic that I really started the mission that I carry out. This is a real photo, you don't see the horizon, it's all white, it's called a whiteout. Well, almost the white house. With a true white house, you wouldn't see this little group of people. There. So I, I learned by seeing and listening, and using my senses from Sami and Inuit, these are indigenous people in the north of Europe, in Greenland, in Arctic Canada, so many Arctic people also in Russia. So these people, they have this connection to nature. They're very close to nature. They see themselves as a part of nature. When they go to find food and to see how it looks like, nothing grows. Very little grows there. So they need to hunt. They have to eat polar bear, a seal, sometimes a whale. But they will never take one animal too much. Because they understand, whatever they take, they're taking a part of themselves as well. It's one big organic system. They're also dependent of, of understanding their environment and surroundings for their survival, of course. You see, it's very harsh. Now have a look again. This is Svalbard, where I met Mr. Ricardo and Sophie. So this is Svalbard in winter, February. I took exactly the same photo in summer. Now this is what we call the high Arctic, 1,200 kilometers from the North Pole. It's nothing, believe me, it's very close. This should be covered in ice even in the summer, but it's melting very, very fast. You see, what you see is, is the permafrost, 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 permanently frozen soil. Ground permanently frozen. And that is thawing. It's warming up. So the ice is melting, and then the layers deeper and deeper. The frozen layers are always getting more deep, and the soil is becoming like a swamp. It's becoming muddy. And the few houses which you can see, see today, they're all on poles. They're built on poles in the Arctic because it's normally permafrost. You see that the poles are now like this, they have an angle because the soil is moving, because of permafrost. Now a photo like this, you see in the middle of the photo, I can't point because it's a, like a LED screen, so it, it doesn't show the laser point, 
but in the middle of the, of the screen, of the photo, you see the horizon. There's a little house in red, do you see that? The red dot on the, on the left on the horizon. It's not a house where people live, it's for uh, scientists to do research and so on. It's polar bear territory, so sometimes they have to hide, they have to charge batteries and so on. Now in the, in the background, it's one big mountain, one big mountain with some clouds. And then you see this S curve, there is this shape. I hope you see it, it's, a bit, uh, it's very obvious above me now, there is this S. So this is a witness, it's a witness of a glacier that is not there anymore. Think of mountains and valleys. The valleys and the rivers, they were created by glaciers, lost ice age and so on. So it shows something that is lost. The four, the, on the foreground of the photo, so below the horizon, this is how permafrost thaw, right? the, the, the soil that is now not snow and icy anymore, that's how it looks like. And then you see this white thing, this bit of plastic, you see that? That is a uh, like a tube and then a pellet. Maybe it's not so clear, but believe me, it's all there. These are all human artifacts. So when the snow melts, we also start to see certain things. <coughs> now, another problem rises. We have the greenhouse gases. We need them. The world needs greenhouse gases because otherwise the Earth will cool down. But the problem is, if we have too many, and if it's accelerating CO2, methane, and so on in the atmosphere, and it cannot go away anymore, that's what is happening now, it's warming up, and we call it global warming. Now, global warming, again, the ice is melting. The weather patterns are getting different. We cannot forecast anymore. Look at the hurricanes, they're becoming more intense. Another problem rises, you see this, and I added to yesterday uh, some other photos. The soil, the ground, is cracking open. Now there is a lot, a lot of methane in the ground, bubbles of air. And this air is being released in the atmosphere. I'll show you another photo so you have a good look, because I know you're in Mexico, so you won't see this. But this is what is happening in the Arctic. This is a, a natural phenomenon caused by our footprint. The soil is cracking open. You see that patch of white? That is pure ice. That is a frozen underground. But the ice layer is getting deeper. The ground cracks open. The methane is being released. It looks like this. And like this. And it's all over the Arctic. <coughs> This is one of these photos I love to show at conferences. I like this photo. It tells a lot of the story that I bring, that I transfer, because it's happening there, and I'm just a witness. I bring it to you through image. So you see water. You see a seal, this animal, sunbathing on a piece of ice. But the ice, the sea ice is called, sea ice is getting in decline. It's melting. You see in the reflection of the water, the glacier tongue. The glacier, we all know glaciers, is fresh water. But the glaciers are melting. And you see, it's already water. You see the reflection of the end of the glacier. The glacier tongue, we call it, it's like a tongue of glacier. It's always retreating. And the volume of glaciers are decreasing. Which is a problem for our weather systems, again. And so, another problem rises. The ice is the air conditioning of our planet. It's white. What is white will reflect heat. So the sun, it provides us light, color, and so on. It's energy. Energy in the form of waves, we call it light. It also gives our colors, huh? but also heat. It's all trapped there in, the, in those beautiful energy waves, heat. Now, ice has to reflect that heat. That's why we call it the polar regions. That's why it's cold as well also because it's a bit further from the sun. But when the ice melts, you have water. And water is dark. It absorbs light. It's dark. So we call it albedo effect. And that is a problem, because the water all over the world, this is the Arctic Ocean, but believe me, there's only one ocean. All of these waters, five oceans, whatever, all the seas, not all the seas, but the oceans, they're all related. 
A fish, in theory, could swim from one ocean to the other. It's all one ocean. And that ocean is warming up. That ocean has less oxygen and more carbon. This is the lung of our planet. When I had your age, I only heard about the Amazon. Of course, it's the lung of our planet. It's important. But now we start to understand the importance of our ocean as well. That is the true lung of our planet. It really absorbs the CO2, the carbon, and it releases the oxygen, thanks also to phytoplankton. Now, all this has not only consequences for weather systems, global warming, but also, of course, all living beings on this planet, including humans. This is the symbol of the art, the polar bear. Mm. He looked me right in the eye when I took this photo. One of those moments I'll never forget. Now, he's a marine mammal. Marine mammal. So he can swim. But still, we see him on land ice, sometimes in the water. He needs the ice. He needs the ice, especially for hunting, for his survival. He needs the ice to catch seals and so on. But the ice is in decline. So the polar bears are heading more south into villages. Recently, I think about two weeks ago, one was being shot in Iceland. Now, Iceland, okay, the name Iceland, you know where Iceland is? There are normally no polar bears. So a polar bear managed to get there, probably on an ice shelf or something. It's, it's a problem. They're looking for food. They can't use the ice anymore to hunt. We go back to Svalbard. You see this glacial ice, it's always this blue color, it's beautiful. In the middle of the ice, you see holes. Now this is because scientists, I'll show you two photos here. Scientists, they need that ice for ice pouring. It's called ice pouring. They make pores, drilling in the ice, like, like uh, carrots. What you see on the left, we Belgians, we are pioneers also in the Antarctic. 125 years ago, we were the first in the world. I like to tell you that because the world doesn't know that. We were the first to really conduct a scientific expedition in Antarctica, 125 years ago. And they were also doing ice cores. On the left, you see the instrument. On the right, it's not mine, that's the only photo that is not mine. You see how it looks like. The deeper you drill in a glacier, the more information you will get about the past. So in Antarctica, and I'll show you first this photo, I should actually switch them. Anyway, this is the Niels Bohr Institute, part of the University of Copenhagen. And it's the one place on this planet where they have the biggest collection of ice cores. I had a special permission to take photos to show it to you also. So what they do is they cut them up, they number them, and we know exactly, ah, we need a piece of ice on that specific location, 1,000, 200 kilometer, uh, meters deep, so you can find it here. So right now, don't see, it's a European project, you see it here. They're drilling 3,200 meters deep to take a little bit of ice. And they can look back 800,000 years in time. Now, how is that? Well, ice is water in its fixed condition. It was a raindrop once that became a snowdrop, a snowflake. And the snow fell on the glacier and it became ice, layer after layer after layer. Now you all, I hope, I don't know if it ever snows here. <laughs> I guess, I guess. So, yes, okay. So a, a snowflake is never the same. All of these flakes are different. And in between that beautiful, well, how should I say, like geometrical creature, that's not a creature, uh, you know, thing, there is always a bit of air. That's what the scientists are looking for. In that air, the air is being trapped in the ice. So these ice corings are looking for the air in the ice. Because in the air, there is all the information. What was the temperature like? What was the CO2 level like? What is the oxygen like? This is how we can actually see what is happening today. Because we can see ice ages, we can see like it's a, what do you say? Like, you know, it's a returning event, the ice ages. But then suddenly we have the Industrial Revolution about 200 years ago, and we see that suddenly the graphic is like skyrocketing, it's going up really, really, completely different than anything else 800,000 years ago. So we know that this CO2 has never been there in this 
quantities, and especially in such a short time. And we also know that we uh, speak about the dinosaurs, the sixth, sorry, fifth mass, mass, extinct, uh, sorry, mass extinction was the dinosaurs. Now, scientists, they start to speak about the sixth mass extinction. And dinosaurs, if I'm not wrong, is uh, 150 million years ago. So humans are leaving such an impact on this planet. One million species are being at risk, the risk of extinction because of only one. Now, a lot, a lot, uh, well, for me, everything started in Svalbard, where I met also Mr. Uh, President Ricardo. Because in Svalbard, in 1984, the Nordic countries, they said, we want to know more about seeds, our food. So we need to know how long the seed, one seed, seeds would survive. So we have this old coal mine, which is abandoned. We don't use it anymore. There is a tunnel, kilometers of tunnels, but at a certain point, 300 meter deep, there is this shaft with a little space. And they said we put a container. We put a container there, and we're going to put the seeds of our countries inside the container. Because the mine has three conditions. It's very dry. It's minus 3.5 degrees in 1984. Now it's like minus 2, so we see 300 meter deep inside this mountain. It's also warming up. It's even in the ground that it's warming up. So it's permanently cold, although warming up slightly. It's very dry and it's dark. These are the three conditions we need to preserve food. So it looks like this. It's a, a door, and the door is closed. As a tourist, you can go to this door. You can have a look. You cannot enter. I managed to enter two years ago. There's this little plate on it. It says Freu. Freu is the name of the Nordic god of fertility and agriculture. So they named it that way. It's a good name. Behind that door, and it's only with the help of the United Nations, they have this advisory board, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, with a lot of other stakeholders. They go once a year inside to inspect. This is how I go in. This black container, 1984, two years later, 1986, they did something remarkable. They said, we're going to do this in a different way. We're going to do this better. We take 20 wooden boxes. You see them here. In every box we put a date. Every five years we take out one box. But in all 20 boxes in 1986, they have put the same seeds. Exactly the same seeds. So they want to see every five years what they did. If they are still alive, if you give them water and sunlight, will they still grow? But the same with fungi and uh, pathog pathogenes, you call them. So I'm not a biologist. Now, but <laughs> so everything that can harm a plant as well, this is also an experiment. Do they survive as well? This was very important and it was a start of something very important, which I will show you in a minute. So they call it the Nordic Gene Bank, and this is this Gene Bank, a genetic database. And you have the biggest here in Mexico for corn and wheat. It's called CIMIT, if I'm not wrong, CIMIT. And I will come back to that. So they call this the 100-year trial. And look at the boxes. The date is reversed. So this box in 2056, on October the 1st, they will open this box. Amazing. Now, this was the start of something else. They said we have to do this for the world. We're going to construct a tunnel in a mountain and we start all over. It's going to be a very, very solid solution for the world food crops because biodiversity is in decline. Species, animals are dying. Plants are also dying. I was always told on oh, the rhinoceros and the elephant and all the, all the so many, so many creatures in the ocean also are at the risk of being extinct right now. Some of them are recovering, blue whales, for example, but still. So, but the same happens with our food crops. Our biodiversity is getting more poor because we have wars, we have climate change, we also have technology, and we have monoculture, and we have pesticides, and so on. You have to understand that if you look at an animal that is an evolution, 
it was something else before, it didn't it evolved, evolved to this animal you see. Same for us. This is with Leave Darwin, I do. <laughs> so we were once, uh, we came out of the ocean. But it's the same with plants. And when a plant or a seed gets extinct, it's gone forever. So the global seed boat was constructed in 2008, and I took this photo 10 years ago. This is, for me, the start of my mission, to tell the world what is going on. Now you see an extra building that they prepared for the operational uh, you know, handling of the seeds that they were brought in. So it looks like this, 130 meters above sea level, so no risk for rising seas, huh? but also 130 meters inside the mountain, three rooms. The rooms are as big as this room, a little bit smaller, but the same length to the back, to give you an idea. Right now, 1.2 million seats, this is the entrance. This is where the door is being opened, this is the least accessible room in the planet. You cannot go. For some reason, 10 years ago, one of the three key holders gave me access. And I'm very grateful for that. This is how I took this photo. 1.2 million varieties of food crops. The capacity of the whole thing is 4.5. Nobody knows if they will ever be filled. We don't know how many food crops there are. You see on the left the entire food crop uh, biodiversity of Canada. You see the Canadian flag. And at the right you see, uh, yeah, at the, right you see the International Rice Resource Institute. Also Mexico with seaweed. You have put your entire collection of 150,000 different species, uh, like genetically different uh, seeds of weed. They're all here. It's the biggest contribution to the global seed world. Well done. It's important. Now there is a third archive, and I'm making a book of the three of them. Because all three have this ambition, they understand that things are getting lost. Arctic World Archive, that's where I met Mr. Ricardo and Sophie. So it's the same, same ambition, but for everything that human beings have like forwarded, like knowledge, cultural heritage, any kind of heritage, data as well. Looks like it, it is. It's a little bit further up in the line, <laughs> protecting the world's memory. And when I met uh, Mr. President, I deposited the first Belgian deposit uh, of the Belgica, the research vessel. Not to, you know, also, of course, to say, hey, this is also, you know, Belgium, we can do, we can do re research. But it's really like in hundreds of years of now, think about it, people will really need to know how, how far we were, you know? Like, what did we know? How did we conduct science? Which methods and techniques did we use on those vessels to understand our ocean? Who knows what will happen in the future? This is the difficulty. We all know it's late, perhaps too late, but we don't really, we are not really able of forecasting what will happen. Disasters, probably. Water, you know, rising, whatever. That's one project. The second project I brought in is the Pacific Island Project. I spent the last eight years documenting those vulnerable islands and atoll states. So, this was Tuvalu and Kiribati. I will show you later. Let's first go to the South Pole. I stay a little bit in the cold. I like the cold. So, this is the South Pole in the middle of the map. And the Blue Route is one of the expeditions I did. It's a huge one, five weeks. And I followed scientists on that trip. Let me try again with this thing. No, no, nothing anymore. Did I do something wrong? No, this one doesn't work, so I'll just do it. One of the things we did is catching penguins. I know it sounds a bit strange. But the thing is, sea ice, again, let me hold this again. Sea ice is in decline. Polar bears is one of those species that are being harmed by that. But also penguins on the other pole. Polar bears north, penguins south, they never meet. Two different creatures. The penguins, they need the ice to hatch, to put their eggs, to you know, uh, produce themselves. So ice is in decline, they might, they're migrating. So we geotag penguins to see to understand this process, where do they go? Are populations being extinct because of the sea ice and so on? Scientists, they want to understand. Another thing, and this was a breakthrough with the help of Chile, actually, 
uh, uh, I forgot the name of the research institute, uh, but we find bird flu. And we found it in what is called Amundsen Sea, named after the Lord Amundsen. <coughs> bird flu is a, is a disaster. <coughs> Excuse me? For many of these uh, birds, uh, penguins, of course. So we found it, and we, we need to know how did it how did it get, uh, get there? We understand now it's birds, of course, that brought it there. But still, it, it was uh, originally from the mainland, so it all came, uh, came down. A part of my work is also showing you the beauty of our planet. Because we need to show what is at stake. We need to show the beauty. This is still happening. Half of the people of the world's population lives in cities. So we disconnect from nature. It's all artificial. We made it, we build it, human beings. But this is still the reality as well. This is the pure nature. Look at some penguins. This is the emperor penguin. It's still on my business card. Because for me, it's not only the first one that I ever saw, but it shows us the, the power of an image. Because emperor penguins, normally they're in group. This one was entirely alone, just in front of me. Incredible. He didn't even look at me. He was a bit sad, maybe. I don't know. What do you think? This photo is double. It shows you it's so pure, so beautiful. But then there is a sadness. That's what an image can do, can invoke emotion. Now, photography is also very useful to document for scientists. What you see here is an iceberg that turned 90 degrees, icebergs that always move, they're melting, so they, they cough off, they cut off from the, from the glacier, then they float. This is the southernmost point in the world, Antarctica. So everything from that moment goes north, meaning warmer water, saltier water, and salt makes the ice melt. So it's an accelerating process. I will need my images to tell the story. <laughs> yeah, here we go. So we see that you see these stripes before it turned 90 degrees. The, the, the surface water was heating up too fast by day, cooling down by night, cutting in the ice, but quite deep. This is like an infographic. It tells scientists what is going on in an image. And photography is this beautiful medium where you snap a moment in time. Well, here I snap the moment of a longer time, day and night, day and night. The water cutting in the ice, again, again. It's all here on the image. Another iceberg, fresh water. You can drink it. You can hold it in your hand and drink it. Fresh water, when it melts, it causes sea levels to rise. When sea ice melts, it doesn't. It's salt water that froze. The glacial ice, that is what we need, but when it's melting, it's causing trouble. You see already a big chunk, a big piece is missing, and then you see the next crack is already there. This is sea ice, and this is how I try in one image. If you didn't hear the story, I would like to, to show in an image what is going on. So I have this photo of one penguin, like asking for help almost. The sea ice that is really coughing up, also, like chunks, so it's breaking up. <clears throat> Now we go a little bit more north, away from Antarctica. These are, these are really remote sub-Antarctic islands, so it's more north. These are islands close to Antarctica. Now a lot of these islands, they have their stories. Every island is a little bit of a world, a planet by itself. So I believe not only indigenous knowledge is useful for maybe a part of the solution that we're looking for, but also to look more at all these islands. Because islands, are, they have their own story. And a lot of stories has to, have to do with biodiversity. These are whalers. You see the last whaling ship. Norwegian whalers came all the way from Norway, crossing the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, to this island called South Georgia. So I put a photo like this. Focus on the chain. The, the, the title is Forever Chains. But these whalers, they brought reindeer from Norway. You know reindeer. They brought the reindeer, put them on the ships, and they said, we put the male and a female, they will have fun. And every whaling season, they will have a third and a fourth, and we can just hunt, and we will have meat. Maybe it's a logic thought, yes. But the problem is, it's called an introduced species, deliberately introduced on an island. 
they don't have natural enemies. So what happens is they need to eat. And they were eating the same food as the left duck. Now at this moment, and this is a story of maybe 85% of the islands in the world, if not more, uh, species, mostly birds, they're very uh, vulnerable, harmful, they're becoming extinct. So you either adapt as a species, but you can't choose, huh? this is the, the question of nature, you either adapt or you don't and you get extinct. Behold the duck on the left. It looks like an ordinary duck, but it's not. It's the only duck in the world that can eat meat. How strange, but it's true. It's an omnivoric duck. It eats of course, the grasses and moss and all this, but it can also eat like dead carcasses of seals. And that is very unique. That is something because of humans. The duck is still alive, it adapted. The pipit, that's the name, the little bird on the right, is highly extinct. It took me a full day to take this photo, and I was lucky because I came close to it. The pipit is nearly extinct because of rats. Rats, mice, also rabbits and cats, always a problem, troublemakers. They need to eat. They proliferate. One, two, three, and then the next one, they have a hundred rats. I don't know if it's that fast, but they need to eat, and they, they eat existing species, and the species are getting extinct. Another example. I know I'm not in Europe, but still, I would like to tell the story. The Norwegians, they said, let's take penguins and introduce them in Norway. There is no, not one penguin in the northern hemisphere. Only the French, they use the name penguin for a specific bird, but there are no penguins. And all other languages, penguins are these birds that we all know, they live in Antarctica. So they, <laughs> this is a crazy photo, this is a penguin in Norway. It's like a polar bear on the south pole, it's impossible. They tried to introduce them, but they failed. Let's go a little bit further. So the island I was talking to you about is that little dot. Now I will bring you to the other ocean, the Indian Ocean, to some other really, really amazing islands. These are French territory, but they're uninhabited and they're experimental islands. Experimental for scientists. Because these are the last places where nobody comes, with the exception of 30 scientists every three months with this ship that you see, it's a research vessel. The only way I could go there was three years in a row, file after file, trying, like, I want to go there to document it and so on. So I managed, and I went with the scientists. And you see, the only way they reach the land now is by helicopter. Not to touch the land by ship, because then you can have a rat, or a, mou a mouse, or maybe a cat, that goes ashore and destroy a whole ecosystem. These are really, it's a, so penguins are not only on Antarctica, actually, most of the penguins are on these little islands, south of Antarctica, a thousand kilometers north of Antarctica. These are the king penguins. Look how pure and pristine these places are, the last places of nature that are almost untouched. With the exception of this island, this is really untouched. This is one of these islands the French government said we never go ashore, never, in Antarctica, in, uh, uh, impossible, like forbidden. <clears throat> so they observe, they monitor from ships, they, have look, you know, they look and try to understand and biodiversity is amazing, it's a waste. Good. This is Tristan da Cunha, named after the Portuguese. This is officially the most remote inhabited island in the world. There's one village, 264 people live there. Now, this is really interesting. Why? Well, these people, so far from the reality that we all know, they also have their reality. It's a little world by themselves. They never go up the island. So they're really close to nature. Think of the indigenous people in the Arctic, but also Pacific. They have this understanding, and they're just Brits in British overseas territories. These are territories Britannicos. It's really interesting to see that. I spent one day met the governor, and went to the supermarket. There is a list in the supermarket. There are only seven family names. Only six, the two hundred sixty-four people, seven family names. So if you need something there, when I go to the supermarket, I try to think with everything that I buy, the process, the efforts, the transportation, 
the CO2 emission. It's crazy what we do. We ship all the way to the other world to peel the fruits and then back to eat it. Same with the salmon here in Mexico. Norwegian salmon, why would you eat it? Why don't you eat salmon of the Pacific? That is an example. It only shows the fruit so they have this list and they put on the list we need a pen, toilet paper, whatever, anything. And they just have to wait, sometimes two, three, four months for the supply ship from South Africa to come. It's the only way to get there. One of those really remote islands, Gough Island. They have a problem with rats. Once, 200 years ago, a ship wrecked. It seems really windy. There was a rat. The rat came ashore, either with a female that was pregnant or a male and a female. And, you know, species are getting lost because rats are eating the eggs of these birds. They're really, 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 really endangered. Maybe 1,500 left. This one. It's an albatross, but it's called a Tristan da Cunha albatross. It looks like this. Beautiful bird. Okay. I'll show you a couple of funny photos. This is a fragment of the largest colony of king penguins in the world. And you think this is a lot, right? Well, have a look at this. The red square, that's what you see here. A lot of penguins. This is uh, South Georgia again. The king penguins are not endangered. Okay, we go much more north now. We go to an island called Ascension Island. In the Atlantic Ocean, on, uh, almost at the equator. Special status, the island doesn't matter. Uh, we'll focus on the biodiversity. Actually, the island of Ascension, in Spanish, I guess, is what is dark. You see this golden rock before the island. It's maybe 200 meters in between. Now, this is interesting. Why did I take that photo? Well, the rock that looks like gold, it's actually formed by guano. Birds. Está formada por el guano, por las aves. You see thousands of birds. Miren, ahí hay miles de aves. Este es uno de los ejemplos. The fregat, but it's a subspecies, the ascension fregat, and it's completely extinct on the island of Ascension because of rats. They can't manage the rats. By the way, I forgot to tell you. In South Georgia, they were where remember the puppets, the duck and the puppet. They successfully managed. To de-eradicate, that's the word in English, to eliminate the last rat, so the pipits are recovered. So we brought in the rat 200 years ago, now we managed with satellite technology and millions of euros, the UK managed to de-eradicate the island. But it's incredibly difficult. So on this island, these birds, the, 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 the only place where they still exist and not being extinct is on this rock. Crazy photo, telling the whole story. Green turtles, another thing that is famous on the island. But I went here in 2018, again with a permit. You can't just go there. You are offending the law. So green turtles, they came here from Brazil, the coast of Brazil. Every year again, to hatch. You can almost put your car in it. They were coming at a specific time. It's really fascinating for scientists to, to find out this time and how do they find a way. It's like whales and birds, how do they find a way? And the timing and everything. Well, now we have like 30% returning and we don't know why. Perhaps foolish. We don't know why. It's a bit of a sad story. A crap. Let's go to the Pacific. The large Pacific. El océano grande, you know it el grande. Y ustedes lo saben, porque eh, su país tiene litoral en el Pacífico. Actually, Todo lo que está en amarillo, de hecho un poco más, es lo que he hecho en los últimos ocho años. Mi misión en los últimos ocho años es regresar al Pacífico, es muy difícil, muy caro, siempre tratando de ver cómo to document the rising sea levels. Because in the Pacific, I think this is the harm, harmfulest, is it, the har most harmful region in the world. A couple of island states, they're really low lying. I'll show you. So one of the ways was, we were sitting there, so four months, I was sitting mostly in uh, Melanesia, which is the southwest of the Pacific, on the Latusso Islands, 
New Caledonia, which Ahí está Nueva Caledonia, France. que es parte de Francia, hay muchas islas. Y fui a las Islas Marshall y regresé al archivo de los fotos, fotos para que here, mis fotos que les puse aquí so con la explicación para que la gente they will, they will know how it like. sepa it be cómo se veía, porque esta isla va a estar debajo del agua. Probably by the end of this century. Just imagine. That's the country of these people. They're losing their land. They're losing the culture. It's not just losing land. It's losing everything that their ancestors have built. This is called an atoll state. This is called an atoll state. It's an imploded volcano. That's the origin. So you see, it's always a serpent. But the problem with atoll states is they don't have altitude. I guess that this would be maybe six meters. Metros, más o menos, o siete, el techo, al techo. Estos estados atolones, atolón, dos, tres metros, si hay eh, más, la montaña más alta mide tres metros y medio, imagínense. O sea, es una locura, ¿no? Esta gente no tiene tierra. Este es Iba, es una isla específica que está en este atolón parte de las Islas Marshall. Es la, una de las islas más densamente pobladas en esta región, tal vez del mundo, y se ve así. La gente vive ahí, generación tras generación. Quisiera señalar, pero bueno, miren del lado izquierdo. Esa es una pared. Aquí, como un muro, una muralla. Ahí se detiene la, esta muralla porque ya no tienen dinero, no tienen tampoco los medios, no hay nada. Pueden tomar coral, o sea, bucean, y el coral se está blanqueando porque por el aumento de las temperaturas, porque los corales And coral reefs are also the basis of whole ecosystems. If you take away the coral system, you take away thousands and thousands of fish. You take away the fruit of these people. And many people will catch one fish, two fish, three fish. They won't do it industrially like so many other countries. No lo hacen de manera industrial como lo hacen muchos países. Pero bueno, entonces estas playas. For these people in the Pacific, it was always the bridge. Imagine you're on a very tiny island. This is our island. And all the rest is water. Well, what would you do? See how we can construct a boat and go to the other island to explore. It's the bridge to the neighbor. The problem is that these waters are now becoming a threat. And the younger generation. Believe me, I talked to these people. I spent weeks and weeks living amongst these people. This is in Polynesia, Kiribati. Kiribati. They say Kiribati. These people are afraid. Esta gente tiene miedo y debería tener miedo. Because they see two generations already, they see differences. Dos generaciones ya ven diferencias. No solamente es el aumento de los niveles oceánicos que van a cubrir la tierra. Es más que eso. Imagínense el agua potable de los recursos naturales. Agua capturada o captada de la tierra. Que normalmente se puede beber de esta. That is becoming salty. Se está salando. So here you see one of the seawalls that is made by coral reefs. Tuvalu, another sovereign state. It's a state with a president. It's sovereign. It's a country by itself, a voting United Nations. Look at this island. This is Tuvalu. Tuvalu has coastal erosion, being eroded by the sea. The sea takes away. Look, this is my drone. Top down, 90 degrees. To show you the reality. See. Or lagoon, Mar, land, and sea again. La tierra, it's always a sea. Laguna. They love the sea. O sea, the sea is becoming a threat. Look at this. And the only thing against coastal erosion with the help of the United Nations is planting mangroves. Millions and millions of mangroves around the islands because mangroves is, they, they keep the soil together. That's what you see here. I actually collaborated two days with Miss Tuvalu. <laughs> I was like a media thing. So I said, I'm going to join. This is also how I see the reality of all these plantations where you take photos. This is again Tuvalu. Sorry, Kiribati. This is Kiribati, but they're all very similar. Atoll states. So this is the island of Tarawa. And you see far away at the horizon is the next one. Now, people don't have just boats like that. 
no tienen eh, the, botes o sus lanchas así, ¿eh? Let's call them like a tribe. It's not really tribal there, but no, let me call them tribe leader and the leader Digamos que of the es el village leader de la tribu. And he would make sure si that anyone who really needs a boat can use his boat. Si the la people have to walk, la have to wait through the water. Eh, if they want to visit their aunt si or grandmother, they have to go tía, through the water. And the water is rising. They have to wear a boat tight. And soon here, and then maybe there. Aquí, luego va a llegar a really acá. Small y si el niño es pequeño, si es un niño pequeño, por ejemplo, pues qué hace? This is a child looking. Wow. Este es un niño que está viendo really wonder, la realidad. Me pregunto, photo, cada vez que veo esta foto, me sad, a mí me, me entristece. Photos, el momento, really inside the photo. Cuando veo esta foto, yo pensaba, pensaba ¿qué piensa ese niño que está parado ahí? Está pensando en el pasado. Does he think of the future? Where will we have to go? Does he just look at it and do and things like how can we solve it? Or? But the reality is also with, with the infiltration of salt water, nothing grows. They have a lack of land, but they have salty soils. So they have to import everything, really everything. This is Tuvalu, the reality Tuvalu. And I have a lot of photos. I always take one photo. I can show you only garbage. But I show you this because there are also palm trees. So you see the environment to try to bring that message to you as well. Look how small Tuvalu really is. Now, on this presentation, I only show you photos. I also show movies. This is an extract of one of the movies. We all know this number, 2015. Uh, I forgot the, the number of the cup. There's nothing in Paris. Paris agreement. I think it was 2015. The world decided 1.5 degrees. We have, we have to set these limits. We cannot go over 1.5 degrees. And we are now at 1.5 degrees. Now, another island, Palau. This is different. Palau, they have mountains, and, wash, and they understood what they have, they have to preserve, and they understood that really, really, really early. So they said we have, we have to establish marine protected areas. We have to monitor what is living in the water. We have to take out, but just to the extent that it can reproduce. It's called sustainable, sustainability. Otherwise, we just take, and at a certain moment, it's gone. And Palau came up with this idea. This is my passport <laughs> So they came up with the Palau pledge, which is a contract. You have to sign a contract in your passport where you say the only footprints I shall leave are those that will wash away. So this is the Belgian research vessel. I'm contracted by the Ministry of Science to provide the visual communication. And it's nice for our government to have photos and for the people of Belgium because it's tax money to know where the tax money is going. But for me, it's also the bigger message. I collaborate with the French, the Italians, and the Norwegians, and so on. Because for me, it's really, okay, these are photos on the bridge, the ship, and the cranes, and so on. It's a beautiful ship. But it's about this. Oceanographers, they are now preparing this thing, this device, it's called a rosette, with Niski bottles. All these bottles are sampling bottles, they need water sampling. I'm a sailor, for me the, the, the ocean is horizontal. This instrument goes in the water, five kilometers deep, to take samples specifically on, on points that they decided on, 3,355 meters, we need a little bit of sampling. Why? Well, because the ocean is changing, and we know quite a lot already, and there is so much we don't. So marine research is really imperative, it's very important. All about the water. So here we're, we're checking CFKs, do you remember CFKs? The product that was in the, in the fridge and was creating the ozone layer. We abandoned it with the Kyoto Protocol and so on. So that's a good thing, but they're still there. We need to trace, we need to understand. But also oxygen and also CO2 and so much more. So these are photos of the labs. Now this is also something really important. There's another problem. 
And they looked at this very carefully. Y lo vimos and con mucho more cuidado y aún con más cuidado. Can you see all these little dots? Alcanzan a ver unos puntitos como confeti. Son microplásticos. Está en todos lados, no solo en la superficie, sino que se degrada. Macro se hace pequeño. Nano. El macro se vuelve Even nano y aún más veins, pequeño en las, air. Más pequeño en las venas, no en joking. el aire. No es It's broma, eh. All over se ha encontrado en todos los planetas. So we have to cope with, we have to do something about this. I'm not an activist, but I really want to do something about this. Instruments to observe the ocean, to understand. So these are floats. It's a United Nations program called ARGO. Two more slides, I'm so sorry, but it gives you an idea. So we are letting the, the float in the water. And they're programmed. It's a whole cycle. They release themselves into a certain depth. They measure, they go up to the surface, and they send everything to a satellite. The satellite sends it to the land server. It's open source. If you give me time, I will find the link for you. You can have the data sheets, and that's how it should be. Science has a diplomatic thing as well in this crazy world of conflict, but also to understand worldwide what is happening. And these flows are everywhere. So this is really good. It looks like this. That is the little etiquette on one of these floats. So you put the dates when you deploy the floats. And if you fish them by accident, I think it's mentioned there. Yeah, it's not military. And has a commercial value. Uh, uh, no commercial value. So they ask to return it if you accidentally fish it out. Okay. So of course, on all these endeavors, I would like to show you some beautiful creatures and photos that I took all over the world. And this was in the Atlantic Ocean, five weeks on the ship where I took that blue photo and started this lecture. Flying fish, very difficult to capture. This is an orca, but it's not just an orca. It's called type D. In the, in the southern hemisphere, you should Google it. Orca type D. Google will tell you. Oh, very few sightings, very difficult to find. I have one photo near these crazy French islands. Flying fish again, using the tail to... Uh, fly fishing. No. To not go in the water again because the predator might still be there. And sometimes I also go under the water. A veces sí. Depende mucho porque tengo un problema del oído y no puedo hacer mucho. But I can go under water as well. Now this is really what it is about. It is about. How do you say that in Spanish? Conciencia. Thank you. It is a matter of time. It's getting urgent. I try to do my best. Thank you for being here today. Conferences, universities, also publications. This is the Belgian Senate. I gave a lecture. This is the heart of the European Commission in Berlin, Berlin, Brussels, where on Europe they also exhibit. European uh, Environment Agency, es la, la very important to implement science in policy, part of what I do through image. Eh, so they uh, finance de all these photos and they're traveling around the world. And right now there is a beautiful liderante. photo exhibition at the Belgian Embassy. So you can Google Belga. Belgian Embassy, you can have a look there, all outside. This is uh, the uh, Belgian Embassy in Switzerland, este es this is the Belgian Embassy here in Mexico. So thank you so much Así que for being here today. Por haber I appreciate it. Les and I would like to thank you again, Mr. Uh, President Magistrate Ricardo, Señor Presidente also Sophie, uh, Ricardo Sodi, I'm sorry, Sophie. also Sophie Sodi. Uh, I would like to pass the word to my dearest Sophie. friend, Sophie. Mario Gómez. Thank you very much. lo más grande y lo más concreto posible se nos acompaña vamos a pedir amablemente a nuestros asistentes que desee realizar alguna pregunta es suficiente levantar la mano si quieren hacer preguntas por favor levanten la mano para que les pasen un micrófono y podamos traducirle la pregunta a Christopher pueden preguntar en español por favor 
Christian. Let me share the, the, the experience where I met Christian. That's me in the Arctic Archive with the Mexican Mexico flag. The, the small and the large one. And delivering the file. Ese es el, abajo de la bandera de México so está el documento en, 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 una, en un microfilm in, uh, especial que se hizo para preservar el, los archivos del Poder Judicial del Estado de México, los documentos fundatorios del de Estado de Mexicano de México en general y sobre todo particularmente los del Estado de México. Siguiente. Esa es la entrada a la mina. Ahí entramos a la mina a menos 15 grados centígrados y ahí que nos dieron un poquito de aquavit, que era un licor muy fuerte, ¿te acuerdas? Christian, ¿tú te acuerdas, Christian? Sí, sí, me acuerdo. Estuvo sharing a bottle of aquavit. Y bueno, siguiente, por favor. Esa es la entrada de la mina cuando so estábamos preparándonos para entrar. Tenemos que usar cascos y material de protección. Siguiente. Y aquí está Sophie con su hermana y conmigo a la entrada de la mina. Esa es la parte de entrada de la mina donde se depositan los archivos de la mina. Muchas gracias. Si alguien desea realizar alguna pregunta, algún comentario. Okay. Hi, good morning, thank you Buenos very días. much for your talk. I think uh, it's very Christian. interesting Me the way that you put the problems that we have in the world. And I really appreciate that you show the main problems that we have, like the carbon problem, the garbage problem. And uh, I think pet recycling and separating garbage is not enough. Uh, we need to uh, set strategies to increase forest areas because that's the most important thing to keep carbon down. And also uh, to avoid the exotic species to have uh, species from other countries. Especially here in Mexico, we have that problem. Uh, people think that buying exotic species is cool, but we're having a, a great problem with our native species. So thank you so much for sending that, that message to all the people here. And I hope we can uh, make a reflection on that. And I want to ask you, if you have uh, one suggestion, a clear suggestion, and what do the people that do politics here have to do to, to make a good decision about the environment? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very valuable contribution. Um, well, I'm, I'm not an activist. I can give you my, my, my opinion. So I do believe that we need knowledge. Knowledge can be also transferred to humans. When people know, they can act with this information. If they don't know about the people, they don't know. So how can they act with the world? So you have to continue. You have to make sure that the message reaches as many people as possible, the whole, uh, well, I think all citizens of Mexico of the world. That's one point. The second point, I would say, is, uh, well, maybe with the plastic problem, maybe you can think of specific incentives. What if you, I don't know the word in English, but what if you put a little value, maybe five pesos, I don't know, to return plastic? Well, I'm sure a lot of people will return the plastic. So just make it five pesos more expensive, of course, it's not that easy as I'm telling you now. You need to implement policy for companies and so on. But this might be a solution for the plastic problem. Maybe a part of the solution, but all small parts make a big one. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Cristian, muchas gracias a Thank nuestros you. asistentes, Christian, a nuestros participantes. Y bueno, pues, ¿qué les parece? Um, impresionante y por más impactante con nosotros estos temas. Uh, eh, sin duda, topics, hacer conciencia es una cuestión de tiempo. Es el título de esta conferencia magistral y por la participación uh, a nuestro colectivo, invitamos respetuosamente a nuestro presidente del Oficial de Estado de México, magistrado doctor Ricardo Sodi Cuella, para que haga entrega del reconocimiento por participación this recognition a Christian Clowers, photographers y expedicionarios.
Nuestra querida licenciada Sofía Sodi. Con esta imagen damos por concluida esta primera actividad la conferencia mundial de este foro ambiental de Estado. Los invitamos a permanecer en sus lugares en breves instantes. Estaremos dando inicio con nuestra siguiente conferencia. Después de esta conferencia nos toca ya ir a un proceso, de modo que les pedimos encarecidamente permanezcan en sus lugares. Nuestro ponente ya está listo. Muchas gracias.